Um, yeah, kick things off here. Thanks so much for everyone uh, joining. Uh, I'm Yuri, co-founder and CTO of Latitude. I'll just um, give a brief introduction of what Latitude is, for those of you who don't know. We're a platform for supporting entrepreneurs in Latin America, and we do it in these three main ways, which is uh, building a community for folks. We've got about a thousand plus founders and angel investors now. Uh, we also build some products, which I'll talk about at the end for those who will stick around. Um, and we also uh, provide founders with capital. So uh, we have a pre-seed fund that's been operating for about two years now. Uh, we've been able to help quite a few folks. I think over 100 companies invested. So yeah, those are kind of like the three main ways that we engage with, um, with the entrepreneur uh, community. And yeah, I think we can go to the next slide. So why are we doing these tech talks? Um, the basic thing is basically, um, I don't know, nine out of 10 founders I talk to are struggling to build uh, amazing uh, technical teams in Latin America. And so we are launching this event series. This is the third one we're doing to help develop more tech talent in the region and also get folks excited about joining early stage. Because I feel like not only there's a lack of talent, but also from the engineers that I'm talking to, only a few understand equity, understand early stage, understand why a journey uh, of an early stage engineer is, a, is an incredible journey and it's uh, full of learning. So yeah, that's that's why we're doing this. And without further ado, I'd love to introduce our guest today, uh, Andre Peña. Andre, please join us here. So yeah, I'm a huge fan of yours and everything you're building at Pinto, also a customer. Um, so yeah, welcome. And uh, today we're going to talk about your journey, I guess, journey from an engineer to the leader, business leader that you've become. Thank you very much, Yuri, and uh, my dear Carmen and Mari, the team. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to this to this conversation. I'm excited to to join you here and to join in the effort of uh, spreading a culture of building tech companies in a more uh, efficient way in Latin America. So that's that's a, a very cool mission. I hope uh, this conversation can be useful to most of you who are watching, at least. And I think you're joining us from Mexico right now. Can you tell a little bit more about kind of like uh, why you're you know why you're there and what's your new role? Of course, yeah. So I am in Mexico right now, and I moved here. And I moved here because uh, the company I created in Brazil ten years ago today, Quinto Andar, uh, is expanding internationally. Right? We um, we own some classifieds in Latin America, uh, throughout Latin America, in, in Argentina, in Peru, in Ecuador, in Mexico. Uh, but besides the classifieds, we are expanding the business model we, are, we have created 10 years ago in Brazil into, for the first time, into a foreign country. This country is Mexico. So I'm here with the uh, goal to restate or, or re uh, do once again the same exercise of product market fit that we did in, in Brazil 10 years ago. And it's something that I do like to do. And it's, it's been interesting. Mexico is an interesting country, is an interesting economy. And it, I, I think it's going to be successful, I hope, and I, and I actually believe. Awesome. Well, hopefully it's as amazing of a product as it is in Brazil. Like I mentioned, I'm a customer. Uh, and it was a no-brainer. I don't think there's anything as close to Quinto in terms of the experience uh, as uh, you guys have built. So yeah, amazing. Um, the first question or comment I want to make is, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I, I joined as a CTO of Escali, which is another Kazakh company um, back then. And I started to sort of discuss with the HRs, like, oh, we have to change all these, you know, titles from developers or programmers to, to engineers. And then they're like, why? I'm like, why, why do we care? And so I, I sent them a message to the CTO uh, email thread there at Kazakh, and you were one of the people that actually replied. So thanks so much. I was like, yes, I'm not crazy. There's, uh, there's actually something there. Uh, we don't have to focus a lot on it, but maybe just make a quick comment about your thoughts yeah. on that. Of course. I do remember that email, by the way. Uh, I think, that, so th there's not a lot of a difference between uh, an engineering, an engineer and a, a developer, software developer, software engineer versus software developer. But I like the word engineering because engineers, what they do is they plan something, how to plan how to build something that is supposed to do, to, to have a certain practical uh, uh, application. 
and they they develop that. And if you say only developers, it looks it feels like the the, the person is developing something someone else planned. And it, that's not always true. Actually, that's most times not true, right? So um, at Quinto Andar, we call it the software engineer career ladder. And this software engineer career ladder, we understand that very young software engineers who come out of school are probably not going to be experienced enough to plan something. They're going to build something. Someone else helped they plan. But the ladder is important. So when you get to step three or to step four, or whatever, you're going to be understanding what you want to build. Uh, by looking at the market or the need or the need of the company or the business. So you look at the business, you think of what you need to build. And this is why I like to call it software engineering, engineer. And on top of that, that's actually how the industry called these people. Nowadays, there's not much discussion at the time of that email, it was more than a couple of years ago. Uh, it, it was something new in Brazil. And we, and I, 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 talked a lot to, to Silicon Valley companies and everybody said software engineer and what the engineer should do, et cetera, right? Because of this, this things that just, just defended you, just, just explained. So, uh, so this is why we created at Quinto Andara the software engineer career ladder instead of the developer career ladder. But if, you, if, if you're in our company, you say developer and you want to say developer, I am not offended at all. So that's, that's fine. Awesome. Thanks, thanks for sharing your perspective. And I think it's sort of in line with how the industry has evolved because more and more, I feel like the all of the parties that design the product and the engineers are all kind of participating in the product decisions um, versus like the whole kind of waterfall process that used to happen. So yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess, you know, I love to start at the beginning. So one of the things we get a lot from founders is like, how do I find my CTO, my co technical co-founder? And it's so difficult. How did that work for you? And you know, what kind of motivated you to take the risk of becoming an entrepreneur? Yeah, so I, I don't know how to find a CTO. I'm, I'm one myself, I don't know how to find us. But uh, it started, well, we were, uh, I, I, before Quinto and I, I went to Stanford where I met my co-founder Gabriel for a, a, an MBA. And before going to Stanford, I was in the video game industry. So I used to, to port, video games from one platform to another, which is port means rewrite it in a newer technology usually or in a different technology. So we, we would get old console games from these publishers and port them into mobile phones. And at the, at the time, mobile phones were not smartphones, were dumb phones that ran uh, Java micro edition. And although it's called Java, it's not object oriented. It's just, uh, it could be, if, if, you, if you were brave enough, but their the phone had no memory and no processing capacity for it. So we would treat that as, as if we were writing a, 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 a something in C and, uh, and we would, would, would do that. So right, we would rewrite code to run in smaller hardware and more modern hardware, et cetera. And that was my, my life, most of my life. I've created some, a couple of video games, not many and, and not, none of them successful, but that was most of my life uh, before Quinto and that. And one day, I, I don't know, I, we were like a 60 person studio. Studio was a, a, a company that develops video games called Studio. Uh, so we were a 60 person studio and I thought, look, uh, I actually talked to, to one of my clients and said, you know what, uh, the real, the currency in Brazil really is more valuated now. The dollar is, is worth fewer reais because I think the, the dollar was two point something, then it shifted to 1.6. And my, all my costs in US dollars were more expensive. All of a sudden, so I, I tried to renegotiate and I called this person and said, hey, I need to renegotiate because of a macroeconomic situation. And he politely responded that that was not his problem. That was my problem. And if I were, uh, were not making money or was, were losing money, I could just break the contract and he would hire someone else in Poland. And when I heard that, I realized, hey, what I'm doing here, it's completely replaceable by someone else. And if I, if I stop working now and my team stops working now, the world is exactly the same. Someone else is going to replace what we are doing. Then I, it, it, it came to me that I was not doing something cool or something that was important to the world. I was doing something commoditized. And I decided to uh, build something else, but I didn't know how. That's why I went to Stanford. That's, that's the beginning of the story. And at Stanford, I met Gabriel. And we thought as every entrepreneur in the beginning of a business, you think 
you're going to get a PowerPoint and you're going to get funded and you're going to get back and you're going to nail it, right? Otherwise, if you didn't think you would nail it, you wouldn't be an entrepreneur. Come on, everyone, right? You always think you're going to nail it because it's you. Uh, that's what we thought. It's us. We're going to nail it. Look at us here. Look at the business we, we have designed. Actually, it was cool from the beginning, the design of the business. And we built this PowerPoint, came to Brazil, talked to the funds. And every single fund that talked to us said, that's very cool, but that's very complicated. Therefore, you're not going to make it. I wish you success. If you make it one day, call me. I'd like to invest after, after it works. And I thought, well, after it works, I probably will need you to invest. But uh, that's that I couldn't say that, just think. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, yeah, and I remember hearing from folks at Kazakh as well, kind of a little bit from their side of, of the stories. Yeah, like it was difficult to see kind of a new model, completely new model coming out of lockdown. So I think you guys are very courageous, I guess, to, to propose that. Um, and double clicking on that question, you know, you, you went to Stanford, you kind of looked at doing something more meaningful. Had it ever crossed your minds like, okay, well, I'm going to go and work at, you know, whatever, uh, Tesla or some other company that you thought was also adding to the world versus like, no, I'm going to go, as I always like to describe it, like, I'm going to go to the open ocean and this small plastic boat and try to make it. Um, what was the decision between those two paths? Well, that, that, that's the advantage of being two, right? Uh, we were two co-founders. We met each other and we started discussing. We loved, uh, we fell in love with the, the idea. We developed the idea. And we fell in love with the problem that we were solving. And we started studying this problem of, I mean, the problem is that finding a place to live sucks, right? And, and, and renting a house sucks even more. So we, we looked at this problem and said, well, oh, this is a cool problem to solve, let's solve it. And when we were at the end of the MBA, so we had an agreement, uh, Gabriel and I, we said, you know, these uh, recruiters, they, they love recruiting MBAs. They're going to call us. They're going to say, come here. You're going to have a salary. You know what salary means? Every month you're going to get paid. Oh, that's sexy, right? And if you go do your thing, you know it's not like that, especially in the beginning, right? And we, we agreed among us, uh, between us, that uh, we would not take any call from any recruiter at all. So we didn't. We, we, we didn't respond to any email from recruiters. We didn't take any calls and we didn't send any CVs at all. So we, we ended up not having this trade-off. We just eliminated it on purpose. Right. Just, we wanted so much to do it. And if, if, if this is the thing of being true. If you, were, if you were one of us only, we probably would have fallen, either of us would probably have fallen into the temptation to, let me talk to this. Maybe I'm wrong here, right? And if there's someone else there, you need to, right? you need to, to support, you're not going to abandon the boat so, so easily. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, over and over, that comes up also from founders. Like, oh, do I need a co-founder? I guess that's a, that's a great way to explain why you need that kind of support and uh, somebody to convince you that you're not crazy or maybe just a little bit crazy. Uh, or, the, or, or, to, or to share the, the guilt. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, I guess it's a good segue into my next question, which is kind of like the beginning, which I always find to be a very magical time and only a few people, right, that were on the team would know exactly what happened in, in that period of time. So like, I don't know, take us maybe to the first six months of Kimto. Curious, how was it like, uh, what was your role? Were you still coding? And like, uh, what was the team like? I accidentally muted here, but our first six months, uh, they lasted three years actually, because uh, we raised a, uh, a, an angel round, then another angel round, the second one, and that we had to make that money last until our series A that came in 2015. And uh, we came back to Brazil in late 2012. So uh, at least two and a half years, we were counting the, every single penny uh, to, to see how much money we would have and how we would not go bankrupt the following month. And we were generating revenue, but very little revenue, very, very few contracts. And um, it was a little bit desperating, but we knew we were onto something because, I mean, this market was so broken. Uh, the experience in general is so, so broken in real estate as a whole, because well, Brian knows because he worked in real estate as well. 
and it's broken not because people are bad. It's broken. It's broken because it's too fragmented, and and there's a lot of reasons that that take. We can talk about that, but there's business and, and economic and economy reasons that make this this excessive fragmentation become a bad experience or a difficult experience. On top of that, it's something so important for people, so important because it's just the basis of the pyramid of Maslow pyramid, right? I mean, it's, it's the place where you're going to live. So this is really critical. So someone has to solve this. And, and usually uh, venture capitalists would ask us at the time in Brazil, they weren't, the, the venture capitalists were less sophisticated than nowadays, of course. And they would ask who else in the world did it? And we say, nobody. And why is it you, right? If nobody else did, why you were going to do it? You think you're any special? And uh, uh, we, we couldn't answer yes, it would be too arrogant. And we didn't know what to answer. I said, yeah, I think we were dedicating to this problem that no one else is dedicating to. The, 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 the word uh, prop tech didn't even think of existing yet, right? That, that didn't, wasn't, there wasn't a thing yet. And so, so we, we got these series A funding in 2015. When things started getting better, uh, we would be sure we would, pay salaries every month, we would be sure we would get paid every month. Uh, we would then move to Sao Paulo. Uh, we were, at the time we were in Campinas in, in near Sao Paulo, just because it was way less expensive to build there. Uh, so this, this, is, this is the beginning of the, the first six months that actually were two and a half years for us. Yeah, pure hustle. Um, that makes sense. I guess um, my next question is sort of connected to the, so the title of the talk is kind of the journey, uh, your journey, you know, from an engineer um, to a product and design leader, then to a general manager of a country. Um, one of the things I've noticed when I was looking at your journey is just like this impressive path, which is not a very common thing and not a lot of folks are able to go all the way through that path, right? Of starting as an engineer and going all the way to kind of like, a, I would call a world-class uh, business leader. Um, so yeah, would love to hear your thoughts, kind of like how that journey was for you and, and the main learnings. I think the main difficulty for us engineers when we start dealing with less exact, less technical stuff is the uncertainty of, am I doing the right thing, right? Because when, you, when you're just coding in the beginning of your career, you code, you kind of compile and then in my machine, it works. That's, that's the steps, right? It I write the code, code goes through compiler. In my machine, it works. You know what? It, it, there's a stress test and the code is working. So I'm doing the right thing. Look, it broke, but it's a million users at the same time. So let me fix it. Let me rethink this algorithm to reduce it to, I know, O N log N instead of O N square or something like that. So that is, that is not easy. That is not easy, but that is, more tangible than managing people. And the difficult thing about people is, and the good thing about people as well, is that they own, they, they have the, their, their own opinion, right? It's not your, the computer doesn't have an opinion, at least not yet. So you write the code and you deal with the computer and you, you can't be happy or unhappy about the computer. The computer's not gonna be happy or unhappy with you. It's you and you. And if you're dealing with someone else or leading people, uh, you have to explain what you're feeling and we have to understand what they are feeling and that makes it much less tangible. And when you start managing, like in the beginning of Kintunda, I would manage 20, then 30, then 40 people and up to 100 something people was that scale that you know everyone's names. So you kind of know most people, how they think and what they are good and what they're not so good. And you can arrange a team and everybody's in the same office. And you want to talk to someone who just had like, hey, and you do this and you can talk to that person. Or you listen to someone saying something, you know what, this person is a little bit mistaken. Let me go there and talk to him or her. That is way less difficult than what we have right now at Kinton, which is 4,000 people, out of which a little bit less than 1,000 is tech. And this is, this is a thousand people is much more difficult because you say something, number one, you say something, not necessarily what you say is what's going to get into people's ears because you know it's too many. Uh, in Brazil, we say telefone sem fio. When you say something yeah. that goes changing, 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 changing many times. And I don't know if young people say telefone sem fio anymore because 
there's no, not a, a thing that a telephone can feel anymore. Anyways, uh, it's, it, and that, that's what happens when you have lots of people and, and people start not understanding what you say, but they're afraid of asking because they think you're too important. So they're not going to ask. And instead of doing of asking, why, why are you saying that? Let me understand. They're going to just do what you say. And if someone asks them, so I'm doing this because Andrea told me to, and that's a horrible answer, right? That because someone told you to is not a reason to do it. Uh, and then it, it, the, the communication becomes the main challenge and, and managing a lot of people. And managing the product is something that I've always done since the beginning of Kinton Bar. Uh, until the other day at Kinton Bar, I, I was the, the, the chief of product. Uh, and I actually like product very much. And I still, I, what I do in Mexico nowadays is, it's, it's, it's like South Park's joke that half product, half engineering, half operations, right? The three halves. Uh, <laughs> so, and, and uh, I, think, I think this is, this is what I do here in Mexico, but, um, the thing of product is what I like about product is not what most product managers like. They like to look at the data and look what people want and build what people want. I don't like that. I like to build what I think people will want in the future. And that's much cooler in my opinion. So I, I look at the data and I said, I said, I usually say, people don't want this. People think they want this because this is what there is in the market. I think they're gonna want this other thing but I can't prove it now. We need to build it first. And that sounds very crazy, right? Um, but I love it. And uh, it, it sometimes goes wrong, by the way. Many times it goes wrong, but sometimes it goes right. And I, I like this uncertainty. I learned to like the uncertainty of building a thing that, that you, you have a vision, but you can't really A-B test it. Not in the beginning. You can maybe test it later to optimize it, but not in the beginning. You need to create it. You need to convince people that they need it. And that's why I came to Mexico because, I mean, people don't know this buying and renting in the internet here, right? It's a little bit like Brazil 2014. Uh, yeah. So we're trying to explain to people, hey, you know, you can rent your apartment online, or landlord or tenant or whatever. Uh, uh, and they just say, why? I mean, I just put a, 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 a small sign in front of my apartment here. It gets rented two or three months later. Why would I want to do it online? I said, because if you do it online, you do it in 15 days instead of three months. And because you're gonna get paid no matter what, because there's an insurance, there's et cetera. And people don't understand the need of it. They only understand the need after they use the product. And that's, yeah. that's something I love. So I compare it to the iPhone. The, when, when Apple launched the iPhone, they didn't ask people, would you like a keyboard on your iPhone? Everybody would have said yes, because my BlackBerry has a keyboard, then I would like a key. I would have said yes at the time. I found strange that this phone has no keyboard. But they actually invented something nowadays. Every single phone has no keyboard. Yeah. I'm, I love the way you described it. And I think it's sort of like the incremental innovation brings incremental impact. So I think, yeah, what you guys have done, you were courageous and create massive innovation, massive leap. And, you know, the risk is bigger, but the return is also bigger. So yeah, uh, very much. Yeah, we get, uh, we get uh, stones thrown in us more often than if we had just created a small innovation, but that's okay. Uh, that doesn't hurt that much. Awesome. Uh, we have quite a bit of questions already on Slido, so move over to, to asking questions from the audience. Sure. I'll ask the team to paste the questions we're discussing so the everyone can see it. But the first one is from Alexander. Um, he's asking for general advice. Engineers want to solve hard problems, but what if you're not a tech founder? How you go about this pitch and any other topics to dive into? So I guess basically it's like how to pitch the technical founder if you're a non-technical founder. Yeah. Uh... So I think, I think if you're a founder, you're probably a founder because you want to solve something. Uh, some founders, but they're, they're not the kind of founders I would work with as a CTO, by the way. Some founders are in, in the, the, the tech world because they want the glamour of having built something or they want to um, they want to, to, they want the money of, of a company that 
became very big and you do a secondary sale and you want all that money or it's a little bit like a, a um, wall street mindset so some founders a little bit are a little bit wall street but these are not the founders i would work with i actually prefer the kind of founder that's a little bit crazy and says you know this problem this problem sucks i want to solve this problem i'm going to do whatever it takes i'm going to believe it i'm going to jump off the cliff and find a way to create a parachute before i get down there uh, are you in? And that's that's what I I hear. I, I speak to people. I, I did spoke. Uh, I did speak to people who who came to Kinton Bar in the first place. And I would speak. And uh, the first engineer we hired came work to Kinton Bar later on when the company got bigger. So he left because of money, and then he came back. Uh, the second engineer we hired is is with us still. And nowadays he says, when you spoke that thing, I thought this guy is crazy. Uh, I think this is not going to work. I don't believe that he's going to be able to do it, but if he does, imagine that if he does, it's going to be awesome. So I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to work here for like six months or so, he said. Nowadays, he says that. And, and that's, that's how actually I pitch people. Uh, I thought, why don't you give it a try? Come work with us. Come, exp come try it. Come start building this, this crazy thing that we are pitching you here. That's our idea of a, a solution for a problem that there is in the world. If you agree with the problem, if, if you agree this problem is important, if you agree there should be a solution, come build the solution with us. If it doesn't work, it didn't lose much. You're still gonna have a job, just raise your hand because you're a software engineer, at, there's a lot of demand for you. If it works, it's gonna be good. It's gonna be very cool. Why don't you give it a try? Yeah. I, I love that way of approaching it. I think the opportunity cost, like people just make this into this huge risk. But um, I always tell them, like, if you fail in a couple of months, you go to your own boss and ask for your job back. They're going to hire you and give you more money because you had a startup experience. So I think, yeah, people think it's a much bigger risk than actually is. Um, Fair point. All right. The next question is from Anonymous. Um, so this one is, how was Kinton Dar's MVP? And uh, would you change something from that MVP if you did it today? You know, um... The, the MVP was enforced by the fact that we did not have enough money to build what we wanted to build. So uh, it was, for, I, I call it the not, not viable yet product instead of an MVP. Um, yeah, so I would, there was a page with a listing and there was a phone and someone would call and I, I would take the phone call or Gabriel would take the phone and say, yeah, you want to visit this apartment? Yeah, in half an hour, okay. And then we would get the bike and go to that apartment and we arrive there like sweating. <gasps> I can just show you this apartment here. How do you like that? So that was horrible. And that didn't actually test. So what, what I call the MVP, for example, I now from hindsight call the MVP, but didn't, didn't call it back then, was when we started booking the viewings uh, automatically. So you would enter Quintandar's page, you would say, I wanna to visit tomorrow 9 a.m. or I wanna visit in three hours. And then we would find uh, an agent that could be there and we would calculate the display, the, 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 the route and the displacement of the agent instantly. And that was freaking difficult. And we started getting bigger, bigger and bigger. And you know, computer engineers, you're here with me. Bear with me. This is a variation of the uh, uh, traveling salesman problem. Mm -hmm. It's a classic problem of computer of computer science. It gets big really fast, and then we started getting big. And booking a viewing would take instead of two seconds, thirty seconds. Like, oh my god, this is taking too long. And then we would have to change that algorithm. And that was a a cool thing to solve. And I mean, in, in a to, to Prior's question, how do you hire people who want to build something difficult? This is freaking difficult to solve. And, and technically, and we've solved it many times at Kinton Bar because you have to build a better and better and better engine. And then you have to build a better, better engine for something else. So the MVP would be this, and what would I change? No, actually, this was very successful. When we then we we created the uh, something that we wanted since the beginning, but we didn't have the volume to do, which is the uh, rent without a fiador, right? The rent without a, a cosigner, which in Brazil is something important in Mexico as well. And, and then we, we started building, oh, what is taking too long? It's taking too long to sign the papers. We sell, send the contract to the landlord. It sit, the landlord sits 
in this in, in the contract for three or four days before they send it back to us, and then we had to send it to the cartório, to the notary, for uh, to to to. And I say, what if we do it online? And at the time, DocuSign was crawling, and 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 electronic signature wasn't a thing in Brazil. So we kind of came with this. And nowadays, anything you rent in Brazil is is either DocuSign or a similar version of DocuSign. Uh, because we came with that idea of we need to make it faster. Come on, let's do it now. So that's that's how we we started building the features until we built something that was truly online, end to end. Yeah, I'm actually very curious about this problem. You don't have to like give up secret sauce if you have one, but the the problem you described is is very difficult, really. And then I guess folks like I don't know, Rappi and Uber and potentially other companies are dealing with that as well. I'm curious how you went about it. Maybe I don't know if you hired like an external shop with a bunch of math PhDs or did you do it internally or like found the open source solution? Just curious uh, the approach. Oh, we did it internally and the first version of it, you asked me if I coded in the beginning, the first version I have coded. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 not a, uh, so what we do is that for any any NP, NP complete problem that you have in the world is you don't totally solve it optimally, right? You just find a heuristic that almost solves it. And that's good enough. You're not going to make sure that you're winning the chess game. You're going to have a high probability that you're winning the chess game. Mm -hmm. And then, then it's how you solve it. Instead of calculating every single move, you just say, is this good enough? Yeah. Okay, go. And then you put a threshold and you solve it and that's it. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so another question from uh, anonymous, um, I guess the what is the importance of product design in your product discovery process? Um, a lot. In the beginning, we didn't have a designer at Quintana. In the very beginning, the designers would be Gabriel and myself, and we would design with a pencil and discuss what if we do this in the flow. What if we the, the product does this, and then we would get put that on the wall or the, the papers with pencils written, and then we would shift to. Uh, PowerPoint, <laughs> and and that was the, the importance of the design, the product design process is that without product design, it's very hard for us to have a product vision. And without a product vision, you don't build something that innovates, right? So the design is a tool for us to get to the product vision. Part of the design tool can be to interview people to understand what they're feeling about the status quo, what don't they like about the current market, right? Which is different from, a B test, very different, right? Uh, part of the design process may also be uh, just discussing what what we would like as users to do this. And, and for that to work, you need to be a, a real user, not a, a, a strange, like hardcore user of something that nobody else is gonna be hardcore, but you need to be a real user and you need to think as a real thing. What if, if I, I'd rather use something else than this, and then you go and test and you come back and interview people. And that was the design process at Kintondar in the beginning. We used a lot of paper and pencil. Nowadays, there are much better tools than paper and pencil. Uh, you can use them. But uh, the, the thing is the process is important. Both Gabriel and myself, we went to uh, Stanford Design School while we were there and it taught us a lot about uh, the, the creative process about well, how to develop something new, how to test it, how to not test it, how to talk to people. And instead of getting what they actually say, you just understand what they're trying to say. That makes sense. And um, in general, on the design, I noticed since early days of Tinto, kind of been following along with, with you folks and uh, design was like a very prominent area uh, in the company. And if you talk to some of the other startups or founders, uh, you know, it's not necessarily a given that design is given such a strong seat at the table, a strong voice. So can you talk about a little bit why you believe that, you know, design is kind of the core, core part of the company? Because the companies we admired the most had cool design. And, and before we created Quintondar, while we were discussing Quintondar, Gabriel went to work in a company in the Silicon Valley. That's a very small startup at the time called Airbnb and their founders are designers. And I, um, so I, I always love companies that do cool design, uh, but I work uh, in the video game industry. And while I was at uh, the Stanford GSB, I worked for PlayStation and they, the video game industry is full of interesting design. Uh, so I think design makes a product, 
right? Why do you think uh, Apple computer, now they have a different processor, a different engineering, et cetera. But four years ago, Apple would use Intel chipset, right? And, and why would a, an Apple computer with this Intel chipset cost double what a Dell would cost with the same chipset, same memory, same everything because of design? Right, because their operating system is carefully designed, crafted, because their computers more beautiful, because they're right, all this counts a lot. So design is a way to tell the user that you care about what they see and what they feel. If you care about what they see and what they feel and you don't invest in design, it's very hard to explain this to the user. You're gonna say it. So design actually says it without the words. And I I like it very much. Nowadays we have very senior designers at Kintwandar. In the beginning, we had just our passion. We weren't professional designers, but we liked it very much. I studied it a lot. And, and that's that's a bit how it started. Amazing. Uh, all right, so the next question is again from Anonymous. Uh, becoming a CTO is hard path when starting as a software engineer. So how was your path and what worked, what didn't work for you and any advice uh, for new CTOs? I think I think we we talked a little bit about that when we said what what is different from from the beginning, right? And I I, I think managing people is the most difficult part of of being a leader, and it's difficult because people are and, and we are as leaders not perfect, not we don't operate the same way all the time, so we are not one hundred percent right predictable, uh, and and the people we we talk to aren't 100% predictable. So allowing for some variation or some variance on the behavior, still staying focused to a, a, a set of, of values that you say, this is non-negotiable. And, and stating out loud, this is not negotiable. The rest is negotiable, let's talk, right? The, the rest is not, it's, it, but the values, core values of the company or of my, my ethical values are not negotiable. And I think, Separating that and, and using that day to day, we learn a lot. We learn a lot when we do, right? And, and this is something hard to learn at school. Right? How are you going to le learn leadership at school? It's very hard. It's much easier to learn uh, the traveling salesman algorithm. Um, so 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 yeah, this is this is how we become leaders little by little. And 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 then some people are better at being a leader, but they are not great computer developers, uh, software developers. Uh, some people are, are great software developers, but not great being a leader. A rare set of people are both. And when you, when you get to, to a place where you have to lead many people, but your passion is to write code, you're probably gonna have to write fewer lines of code until you, you write zero. Uh, but you're gonna influence the way people do this. And this is, to, if, if you think this this uh, uh, it, it, it fosters your passion, then it's it's cool. It's good enough. That's what I think. But but if, if it's okay if you don't want to be a leader, it's okay if you want to be a computer develop uh, software developer uh, your whole life. It's it's not bad at all. Just just that leadership is something that you have to foster. You have to develop. You have to learn by doing. That's that's at least how I see it. Makes sense. And um, a lot of founders actually ask me when they kind of bring on their first technical leaders, because there's kind of like different levels. You know, you have the CTO, you have VP of engineering, you have uh, maybe engineering managers, and they're kind of asking me like, well, what exactly makes a CTO versus a VP of engineering? I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I'd be curious to hear. Well, what the market says, and I'm, I'm not sure that this is the answer. This is what I learned and what I do nowadays. We have our VP of engineering at Kintandar, Paulo Goger. Uh, I learn a lot from him every day. And the VP of engineering usually uh, takes care of the engineering discipline, the horizontal. So how are we going to build this? The tech, it's, it's a little bit more tactical in the sense of, how are we going to separate this? Do we need to build a team that is going to do uh, only the more infrastructure part? Then we're going to have a product, the product engineering team that's going to use this infrastructure components to build product and product and product and new product. And if we have a, a set of infrastructure teams, are these infrastructure components going to be enough for anything that we need to build in the company? What if it isn't? What if it isn't? This is 
and, and how do we build it and which tools do we need? Let's put a director for infrastructure to discuss what tools we need for data orchestration or for well, what tools we need for, uh, uh, for, for, for containing the, the application, right? what, kind of, what kind of containers are we going to use? Right? What kind of, of, I don't know, cloud systems are we going to be based on, et cetera. This is more the VP of engineering and some, some infrastructure directors role. The CEO is, is it, it's very cool. I, I, at least the way I see it, the CEO is closer to the business every day. And we say, well, you know what? I think we need to build this as a product. And my CEO role until last year, it, had a, it was a CPO role as well. So it was comfortable for me to explain like this, but it's, it's closer to what we need to build as a product. To build this product, we're going to need, need I don't know, uh, such resources, people, money, time, et cetera. If we do this, we're probably not gonna, not gonna obtain the return we need in, some, in the time we need. Or if we want to build something that is really crazy, this is the way to go. Let's talk about the product vision of this. I know nowadays the, 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 the fancy thing of the day is the GPT. So, uh, so is, is it, are we gonna use this GPT or not? Are we gonna go for the, the, towards that tool or that, that way or not? If we say that, we have to say that over and over and over in the company and, and make sure everyone is rowing the same direction. Otherwise we have some people doing A, other people doing B and the boat doesn't get anywhere because you're, you're just rowing to two different sides, the same boat. And that's, that's, uh, that's more of the, the CEO, the, the intersection between business and what we're going to do with the product and how we're going to deploy this product and build this product is more of the CEO role. This is my opinion. And, and I think there are exceptions. I've seen exceptions in the world. So uh, I, I don't think there's a right or wrong. Okay. Sounds like the CTO will have a more, like, more defined role in the product vision and strategy versus just looking in inwards on the, on the tech part. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's less tactical, more a little bit more strategic maybe. And the CTO is, uh, I, I was saying CEO or CTO, I don't know, I'm getting crazy. I think you mentioned but, a few times CEO, but I understood that, yeah. And th thank you, thank you for the correction, but I, I just realized right now, this is the problem of doing it live, right? Because we say this <laughs> bullshit and people at home, uh, they have to see us saying this. But uh, the, the CTO, yes, it's a little bit more strategic. Although many VP of engineers of engineering are very strategic as well. So. Uh, yeah, makes sense. And uh, we, the next question is also from Anonymous. Anonymous is on, on fire today. So yeah, hey Anonymous, why don't you write your name? I'd, uh, I'd rather answer questions for someone who has a name. Um, but yeah, yeah here's a suggestion. Yeah, I think we have a, maybe a little bit uh, more uh, shy crowd today. So yeah, it's not, it's not I, I'm, I'm not gonna be offended. Just put your name, that's fine. I'm here to, to answer, go <laughs> on. No one anonymous, yeah. So, how have you built the uh, Kintondar's tech infrastructure, and how did you show your investors that this was actually a tech company and not a service or a brokerage company? Oh, we didn't have to show the investors. I mean, uh, it's actually the other way around. How how investors were curious, like how that you with you the people that live, they would look at us, Gabriel, myself, and the people. Would say, you're a tech company. You're clearly a tech company. Look at the nerds here. How do you think you're going to build? like a real estate company with these people. You're not real estate people. So that, that, that was never a problem. And how we built the tech infrastructure, we started with tech and, and someone, I was reading the questions earlier. So someone has asked uh, what kind of engineers I hired or how I, I would create a tech team. And in the beginning, I would say, I want engineers that can think of the whole system and then build something specific and they could solve problems. So I would prefer, at the time, nowadays we have many flavors of engineers at Kinton Dark because we're, we're like a thousand people in tech. But, but at, in the beginning, we would prefer people who could think algorithms and solutions. And if they weren't very good in a specific language, that was okay. You can learn the language, but it's hard if you need to learn uh, the, the, the thought process, right? The, the algorithms and, and the computer theory in general. So we would select that. We would have a bunch of nerds that know computer theory, they're attracted to working there because there were other nerds like me that like computer theory there. So we, we kind of pulled similar people together. That is both good and bad. And that's bad when we have to 
to be more diverse and think of something else. But that's good when people have to work together and put something together really quick and, and build it. And therefore, we didn't have the problem of convincing people that we were a tech company. We, we, our, our tool was tech. We try to solve, for example, we weren't selling much. Instead of saying, let's sell more, let's put a salesperson in here and, and, and set different, would say, what in our product isn't selling well, right? How can we fix that? And that is a technology company mindset. Awesome. Um, the next question is from Adam. I don't know if uh, I understand it, but let's let's take a stab at it. So what aspects do you or your CTO senior engineering peers look for in a startup and a founder when it doesn't have a technical co-founder yet? So I guess it's maybe like on the angel yeah. investing side, something like that. Well, maybe. I am officially not an angel investor, but uh, unofficially I, I have invested in a very few startups that I find very good. And what I look and investing my money or investing my life, like I did with Kintondara, I find it similar. I find it easier to invest money than to invest life. But I'm at Kintondara, I invest my life. Um, and some other companies I wouldn't, I would invest just the money. But I don't have that much liquidity to invest money all the time, by the way. Uh, and it's not my, my, my job, but I sometimes do. And when, what I look for is uh, three important pillars. Is this, problem they are trying to solve is it a deep problem for people and it's something that really hurts or i mean someone told me twitter was a deep problem i would not invest in twitter when it launched so that that's not a, a bulletproof uh pillar but it's something I, I i like to see things that are solving problems that actually hurt oh this is hurting let's fix it right uh pillar number two uh i think is this market big enough for a company worth my investment? Might that be my time, my life, or my money? So if it's if it's a cool product, that's probably going to be uh, uh, and for a big problem, right? It's going to solve a big problem, but it's something that only ten people are going to use it. It's not a big enough market, right? It has to be something really powerful that would solve an important problem for many many people. And number three, is this team that I'm joining something that gets me excited? Is it the kind of people I want to work with? Is it, uh, are these people, I like to work with intelligent people that can politely disagree with me. And we go home, we disagree, we go home, we have a, or we go away to the bar, we have a beer, it's fine. But we disagree, we are able to disagree with each other. We don't, we don't keep falsely agreeing we don't keep shouting but i mean it's a it's a polite company where we can disagree with each other and my my relation with my co-founder is pretty much that sometimes many times we disagree with each other uh, in the beginning we would do it publicly in front of other people they would find strange where is this company going look at the founders they don't agree with each other uh, now we do it just the two of us but yeah we do it a lot and we do it very i mean a very very calm way so I think this is, these are the three pillars. Uh, people I want to work with, the other way around. People I want to work with, is this problem uh, for a problem for many people? And is this uh, a deep problem that hurts people for real? Yeah, and I think just to add a comment that makes total sense on the criteria on the problem, it's sort of a self-solving mechanism because if, like you, you mentioned about Twitter, right? Like you don't see a, a problem that Twitter is solving. That means you won't be able to help very much because you're not engaged with it. And so like somebody else will understand it. So I always tell people, the angel investors, you should not like go at all lengths to convince them no matter what. They should be people that like self-select to your problem, right? Like, and then they'll be happy to help you. Very, very fair. Thank you for uh, putting this a much more articulate way than I did. This is very elegant way to explain it. I like it. Yeah, and so next one is from Adam, uh, I guess. Oh, no, this one was this previous one. Okay, so the next one's from Alexander. So is there any specific um, from Quinto's culture that backfired or perhaps you wish you had implemented earlier before recruiting 4,000 employees? Oh, yeah, there is. Um, so I would say in the beginning, I like two things at Quinto and Dyer. Transparency and autonomy. 
and I would use these two words, and everybody would repeat these two words, transparency and autonomy. Don't come with me, don't, don't, don't hide your thoughts, say what you're thinking. This is number one about transparency, right? Yeah. And then, and right, we're gonna be transparent with you, we're gonna be transparent with us. You expect us to be transparent, because if I don't like what you're doing, I'm gonna say I don't like, it's fine. But you should also say, you should also say you don't like what I'm doing. And autonomy is, what I expected is that, people would have the responsibility to solve something they would stand up and they would solve. The autonomy thing with time became a different meaning and we had to cancel it. It's not, no, no, that's not a value. No, that's not called autonomy anymore, which is, the, I expected to be a little bit more Spider-Man, right? With great power comes great responsibility and it became uh, autonomy. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> and that's not autonomy. That's, I know, anarchy. Anarchy. And that's, not, <laughs> that's, not, that's not a company, right? That, by the way, you can do whatever you want. Not, not even I can do whatever I want. And I co-founded a company. Come on. You can want to do whatever you want. You can't. You know, there's more people here. So they would say, oh, I don't have autonomy here because I would like to use this programming language. And you're forcing me to use your software stack. Like, yeah, you're, I am forcing you to use this software stack. Definitely, I am. So uh, the autonomy part kind of lost its, its meaning and it kind of backfired in a certain point at a certain point and we had to change it. Yeah, it's, uh, I think Spotify puts it as highly aligned, loosely coupled. So the, the alignment part is important. I actually had somebody on the team ask me, how much money can I spend without checking with anybody? And I was like, how much risk do you want to take <laughs> with that, you know, by yourself? And that like completely changes the question in their mind. So yeah, like when you do things without aligning, you, you're taking on a huge risk. So it's like, oh, I've spent mil $10 million on this project. It's like, whoa, like you better be sure that that yeah. thing is going to pen out to be something. Uh, all right, so- the, the Five last one, minutes, yeah, let's go. Yeah, I think we can do one more and then um, wrap up. Uh, so yeah, from Anonymous, uh, what are you trying to optimize for when you're building your tech team? So I guess this, you know, you mentioned two qualities, but maybe something specific on the technical side. Well, the technical side is, is so I mentioned the technical side. I like people who can think of a problem and design the solution of a problem. And then they'll find a way, if they know how to implement that solution of the problem, even better, they'll find a way. Nowadays, we have experts in specific languages or whatever, but in the beginning of the company, we would not have experts in, in the specific languages, but we had people who could look at a problem and say, I know how to fix this or how to draw this solution of this problem. And that a, a good algorithm would come out, out of it or a good design or a good uh, architecture would come out of it, depending on what you're designing. So I, I, I think this is essential for the company, not to say that you have to be perfect algorithm in the beginning, but you need to, to find solutions, right? You're not, unless you're copying someone, unless your company is a copycat, then you don't need this, this profile so much. You can provide, perhaps go directly to someone who does implement it directly. But that's, that's the, the first step if you're building a team. And then if you, the team is getting bigger, you need leaders and you need people who, who actually pull the team together and say, you know what team, this is how it, what we're building here. And then every single team composed of, humans like ours, like us, uh, at some point, the team is going to complain or is going to, is going to uh, say something is not right. And maybe they are right about that. Maybe they're not right. Maybe they just understood it wrong. So the leader's role is to listen to the people and bring, hey, I think people need this or to listen to the people and say, hey, people, I think you need this and, and, and understand who is who's right in the equation? Is it is it the one above the, the, the overall thing that's going on here, or is it the people? Because complaining is is, is of the human nature. We complain, I complain, and solving problems not necessarily of the human nature. So we, we need someone who's a problem solver as a leader. Awesome. I think that's a great place to wrap it up. We're almost at time. I want to be you know mindful. We still have a ton of questions. We're not going to be able to get through all of them, but it just shows. Um, how much, you know, what a wealth of experience you've built, like a uh, hundred folks showed up today and wow. so many, so many amazing questions. So uh, I want to thank, uh, thank you, Andre, for your time. And I'm a huge fan and I had a, a blast uh, chatting with you. And just in the last few minutes here, um, I just wanted to share in the beginning, I mentioned some of the products 
uh, from Latitude. I want to mention the, the recent one that we announced the private beta for, which is the uh, Meridian by Latitude, and it's a business account for Latam startups. Um, I think if we can go to the next slide, I'll share a little bit more. Yeah, so the key things you'll be able to do with this is you'll be able to receive your money from investors in Delaware or Cayman. You'll be able to transfer your funds with an integrated FX uh, to your local country. And today we're supporting Brazil and, and shortly looking at other markets as well. And they'll stay compliant. So a lot of the other kind of like uh, accounts, you know, offshore will not be able to maybe update your, you know, uh, contrato social. For those of you in Brazil, no, there's a bunch of paperwork with the central bank and other things you have to do. Um, so yeah, if you're curious, you know, reach out to us. We'll, we'll be happy to share more. And it's just another way that we're looking at uh, supporting founders in Latam because literally every single founder told us that like they were not able to open uh, accounts offshore. Yeah. yeah, it was a huge pain. I, I wish that existed 10 years ago. Yeah, it's like uh, Brian always says this because like when I guess when he started it was like 2000. Yeah, nine something eight like it's somewhere around there uh and it was you, you know it was like it was a jungle you had to cut through uh no angel investors no ecosystem and so yeah I, I banks think... banks wouldn't open our account because yeah. we're entrepreneurs entrepreneur banks didn't like entrepreneurs back then so you know you don't have any credit history so think great 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 product well thank you for inviting me uni and uh thank you the latitude team thank you brian uh for inviting me um I'm at your disposal. I hope, hope the conversation has been useful. Feel free to disagree with anything I said here. I'm not a person. I, I know that I say, say some bullshit sometimes. So uh, it's, it's up to you to decide whether what I said is, make, is worth paying attention to or not. And uh, good luck, everyone. Cheers. Thanks so much, man. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.